So now I give the floor to, to Peter Ranaho. So my name is Petri Ranholm. I'm, as uh, Heli told, I come from Aalto University as a guest lecturer here. Uh, I'm a, a senior university lecturer there, and my topics are photogrammetry, laser scanning, and a little bit uh, also remote sensing. And the topic is, as you can see, just basal artificial intelligence. I think that uh, the background of you vary a lot. So some of you are experts and some of you have already heard about these things. So let's see how I managed to uh, illuminate what is this. Uh, OK, so let's start with definition. So I took one source for the definition, very compact one. And actually, it is quite uh, obvious. So. Let's see what it is. The use of artificial intelligence methods to produce knowledge through the analysis of spatial data and imagery. Uh, we can find some other uh, definitions as well, but I think this is describing what's this all about. And then you can see a couple of words there, uh, machine learning and deep learning. Uh, now, these terms are not that clear which belongs under what, but uh, some people think that they are separate oh, things, yeah, and some yeah, people yeah, think that yeah. deep learning is just the sub part of machine learning. But nevertheless, there is slight change uh, between those two, and, and I explain it soon. But about this term, geospatial artificial intelligence, uh, I tried to find some. Uh, scientific articles in which this term appears. And I couldn't find anything before 2014. So it is quite new term. Uh, however, today, uh, some people even say that this is a new field of science and a really important one. But I think that it is just a subword uh, in geoinformatics. So, why do we want to have this geospatial artificial intelligence is automation. Uh, I checked how much data this year is estimated that uh, we produce on Earth. So it was 20 zettabytes of data. I, I have to uh, confess that I, I couldn't remember how many zeros Zeta has. So I wrote it there. So it is 21 zeros in that number. So pretty huge amount of data. And depending on source, uh, it's estimated that 60 to 80 percent of this data has a spatial component. And if something has a spatial component, we can utilize it in our spatial analysis. So it's, it's available. But the amount of data is so huge that we can't even imagine to do everything by some manual procedures. We have to have some automation. And this just basal artificial intelligence, it's, it's one tool how we can do this. So let's uh, check about these terms a little bit. So now, from this slide on, I use traditional machine learning, make the difference between uh, deep learning. And the difference is that uh, this traditional machine learning is more likely based on statistical uh, basis and not neural networks. And then deep learning, it's just a neural network that has a lot of uh, layers. So that, that's the difference uh, in, in my slides. And this uh, image here illustrates that in traditional machine learning, we have clear separate algorithms that we uh, apply one after one, and then we get some kind of result. My example here is from uh, detection something from image. But then this neural network, 
it's just a black box, but it is doing everything that these traditional machine learning algorithms. Then we have this uh, reinforcement learning called also as self-supervised learning. Uh, this is a fruitful topic for movie industry because there are these autonomous agents, robots or uh, central computers that learn what they uh, detect and change their behavior accordingly. And it's, it's very typical in those movies that logically uh, there is no reason that humans exist anymore. So, uh, But if you have a modern car, there is this kind of reinforcement learning in your modern car. If you have a mobile phone, you have it there. It's not that independent, but it is somehow independent and trying to improve your user experience. It's hidden there, but it is there. Uh, we can say that we live in the middle of hype of neural networks, especially with this deep learning. I just tried what happens if I, if I check some uh, Google Scholar articles, so scientific journals with keywords that include neural networks and geoinformatics, remote sensing or photogrammetry. And you can see what happens. The increase of articles is like exponential. And if you think that all other uh, time periods in, in my, my uh, graph here, this is a five year period. And now the last one, now we are living 2023. So still two years to come. Uh, okay, almost only one year, but it will go even higher. Now, if you have never seen uh, a neural network, now you can, can look one on the left uh, bottom corner. So, we have input layer, we have hidden layers, and we have output layers. And as you can see, there is a connection between all neurons, between layers. So in this case, this is fully connected multi-layer perceptron. And what is the secret is those weights or numbers that you can see that are following those connections. Those numbers are the key point. If we change those numbers, it starts to behave differently. And we can have more hidden layers. We can have more of those neurons there, uh, depending if we need more. So if we have more, then it can adjust to more complicated case. So in practice, it's just uh, numerical values of those weights that is defining our uh, neural network. And we have to teach it. And this is the tricky part. So, uh, how to use artificial intelligence in the geosciences? Uh, a little bit mixed with this tra tra traditional machine learning and, and deep learning. Nevertheless, let's start with making measurements, automatical measurements. Uh, well, my field is photogrammetry, so, so these examples come from there. So we can automatically find corresponding observations between images, and we can make automatically uh, dense point cloud utilizing dense image matching. We can do it in traditional way, or we can utilize also neural networks to, to complete this task. Uh, uh, latest research, it's even said that this uh, neural network algorithms that that are finding corresponding observations, it's, it might be even better than these traditional ones. Then for enhancement of data, uh, there are quite many possibilities. Of course, these traditional methods, we filter our images with some filter to get better uh, visible uh, outlook there, or uh, then we can use these uh, neural networks. But there we have to be a little bit careful because we have these uh, generative adversarial neural networks that can create, for example, those fancy fake videos. Uh, you can 
teach those neural networks to enhance images. You can take an image uh, nighttime and you can run it through this kind of neural network and it looked like it was taken daytime. Or you can have very blurred image and you can sharpen it like, like in, in the movies. But uh, the risk is that it is just virtual fantasy, it's not reality. So you have to be really careful. For example, uh, in, in the newest versions of Samsung uh, phones, there is this space zoom option. You can take uh, images out of moon and zoom 100 times uh, ratio. And they look like you have taken them with, with some high quality telescope. But it's just using these generative adversarial neural networks. If, if something really happens in the moon, uh, you won't see it with, with that camera. It, it is some, some virtual. It looks nice, but it's not reality. For object recognition, typically we use images uh, and we use uh, convolutional neural networks. It's a little bit light uh, illustration in, in uh, right top corner of my slide, but uh, perhaps you can see that there is no longer connections between all neurons, but only uh, to some local area. And this is very much useful because images or image patches, there is too much information. If we use this kind of fully connected multilayer perceptron, we have so many connections that it will overfit quite soon and, and it is really difficult to train and, and uh, uh, perhaps uh, we can't even train it reliably. So using these convolutional neural networks, we add these convolutional layers and reduce the number of uh, or the amount of data. And finally, we can typically get uh, just one uh, vector, which is then put in this uh, fully connected multilayer perceptor. And then you can find, for example, Tekkari caps like I have found here in this image. So this is coming from YOLO neural, convolutional uh, neural networks, this result. Uh, the, for analysis of data, uh, I will come back to that soon. And these neural networks, but also traditional uh, artificial, uh, machine learning applications, uh, because they enable quite many applications, uh, especially there is a demand for real-time applications. So something is changing or all the ways happening and, and we can detect it and connect it to spatial data. And then we can quickly get some something automatically out. And the result can be actually prediction or forecasting and even decision making. But again, we have to be a little bit careful when we give this decision making uh, to artificial intelligence. So applications of traditional machine learning with geospatial data, uh, I think uh, you are very familiar with these terms and even contents. So normal classification, especially supervised classification. So we teach our system in such a way that when we put new data in, then we can find land classes or, or something like that, whatever we want to find or, or we know that we can find from the uh, data. Regression, statistical method, uh, relationship between two variables or even multi, uh, variable regression. Uh, I have drawn here a linear regression, which is very simple, but it can be more complicated. So we can create some a physical model that is modeling some, some physical phenomena. And then we try to fit it with regression and we can predict what will happen in those places where, where we uh, didn't have any data. And then we have this clustering. So it's also called as unsupervised classification. So we try to find areas in which those uh, properties of, of these uh, elements are similar. But then we don't know what we found. 
before we make labeling. So this is in that way, uh, it's like doing something blindly. And this has been around uh, for ages. So very uh, uh, many traditional alg algorithms, how you can do this. And you can do all these tasks also by using neural networks, every task. Uh, so supervised, unsupervised classification, and then there is a new term, semi-supervised classification also with those neural networks, because this training part with neural networks requires much more training data than these traditional methods. I emphasize the word much more. Uh, okay, object recognition, it was like my take recap, but we have to identify something and we have to find the location of that. We can do end-to-end -end change detection, so black box, we just put a couple of images in our neural networks as input, and then we get change uh, detection result. But we can also have this kind of natural language processing, so just texts. It is automatically going through some texts, and if there appear anything spatial, it can pick that up and connect also some other information from those texts and create something sensible uh, that is related to, to uh, spatial things. Just to give you some examples, of course, we can practically apply neural networks to, to any task that you can imagine. Just to give you a quick look uh, about uh, alternatives, what you can select. These are methods about clustering and end-to-end -end change detection. I don't know which one is best. You have to try it by yourself and, and have a test data and, and scientific foundation, which is working best for your case, but you do have quite many alternatives. And then regression and supervised classification again a huge amount of uh, different algorithms and, and uh, structures of your neural networks what you can utilize for this task and this is these are not comprehensive lists just giving you impression that yes you have very many alternatives available So let's say we have trained our neural network and uh, during our training phase, it works fine. And we are quite confident, yes, 90% accuracy and we are very happy. But I still recommend that we monitor closely how it performs in the future. Uh, there has been discussion about neural networks a lot, uh, so it's there is uh, danger that they create unbiased uh, results, and in some cases uh, it's not uh, exactly reliable. It can be statistically reliable in most cases, but not every time. And then. Again, a couple of terms that appear in discussion is fairness and accountability. There has been some examples when, when uh, artificial intelligence is making decisions, for example, checking if, if there is uh, automatically, if there is plagiarism and et cetera. And if it fails for some reason, then if actions are made only by, uh, by this artificial intelligence, it can be unfair in some cases because there are no feelings in artificial intelligence. It's just making uh, its logical uh, conclusions and it depends how it was built and trained, how it works. Uh, because these neural networks are black boxes, as I told, uh, when we bring in new data, there is a danger that 
this data is not similar uh, to that data with which we trained it. And if that is the case, then it won't work as well, at, at least. So uh, it's a good idea to, to follow up uh, regularly if it keeps on performing when you bring a new, new data in. Uh, actually, this spatial data is a little bit problematic. Uh, it is problematic for statistical methods, uh, but it is also a problem problematic for, for neural networks because uh, typically these uh, algorithms somehow assume that, uh, that we have st stationary uh, phenomena, so it is repeating all the time similarly, so we can predict how it works. But uh, spatial data is not, so data distribution typically shifts from region to region, meaning uh, you have to somehow adjust your system uh, if you change the area or, or data. And another problem is this uh, independent and identical distribution condition or assumption, uh, which is typically inbuilt in these systems. Uh, so this is also uh, the problem because spatial data doesn't fulfill these conditions because we have some external factors that are creating this, uh, this uh, clustering in, in our data. So it is not fulfilling this. And then the last thing, if we create our system in such a way that there is some kind of end decision or end product, do we have a big risk if it fails? For example, in medical imaging, if you count on artificial intelligence to make diagnosis. And if it starts to fail, then it is not very nice situation for those patients. So, so we have to maybe have some kind of backup system that is a little bit checking what's going on. Now, uh, it's very typical that uh, our neural networks work nicely first, but then when you put put in a new data and, and uh, time goes on, it the performance starts to decrease. And what can we do in such cases? The first one is the main uh, alternative. So we have to retrain again our neural network because it is a black box and there is no fine tuning parameters. So we have to just do everything again. And this can be a very difficult task uh, if, you, if we have to start from scratch. Fortunately, we have this transfer learning, uh, so we don't have to start from the scratch. So it speeds up the process and reduces the amount of needed uh, training data. But still, uh, it means that we have to make some manual measurements or we have to uh, augment our data, manually measure data a little bit, or we can utilize simulation as well in the training phase. Uh, another alternative is that we try to adjust our input data in such a way that it meets better uh, the conditions in which we trained our neural network, but this can be also difficult because usually we don't know what were the, those conditions. So, so uh, you can try it, but in most cases, you just have to train it again. And then because things are developing, so we can have very many different structures of our neural networks and they perform differently. So you can try some other uh, neural network if it works better in your case. And now we have to go a couple of step, steps backwards from those fancy algorithms where we are typically focused in, uh, back to data, because the data matters the most. If we have, if we try to do uh, something with such input data that is absolutely not suitable for our task, we have no chance to, to succeed. 
it doesn't matter if we select traditional methods or new methods or how fancy they are. If if from the imagery, if if there is one color that is representing two different phenomena, we can't distinguish them. It's impossible. So uh, about this classification, we typically uh, use those so-called feature vectors. So it's just feature. Uh, these features can be based on geometrical things. So we have some kind of neighborhood from which we compute some uh, statistical geometrical uh, uh, indexes or radiometrical things like colors, intensity, these kind of things. These are very typical. So for example, if we have a color image, it can be those three color channels. So if we have more channels, all, all channels. But uh, it can be also totally something else. If we want to do, we can utilize, for example, happiness of some area, if we can create some value about this happiness level. And we can classify things according to happiness. So that's totally possible. OK, so this is something that uh, was very typical uh, even 20 years ago in, in the fields of remote sensing. So you just have these features, let's say those bands in, 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 in our uh, satellite image, and we check two of them at the time to see if there is any chance that, that our uh, classification will succeed. And this is very easy and visually uh, nice way to do it. The left image down there, we can see, okay, we have feature one and feature two, let's say red and blue color channels. And we have in our training da data, we know that uh, those points belong to certain classes. And we can clearly see that, hey, hey these are nicely separated uh, groups that, that we can see any uh, classification method succeeds in this case, no problem. But in the right hand side, uh, everything is just mixed together and we can conclude, okay, these two features give absolutely nothing to our classification. We, we can't separate things at all. So we, we should perhaps even think if we drop out one of these uh, features in, in our examination, because it, it doesn't give any, any value. Okay, it looks my slides are frozen. Okay, now it works again. So uh, recently people have started to talk about explainable artificial intelligence methods, meaning that we could somehow trace what's going on in, in our systems. Uh, and uh, this is very important because people want to commercialize uh, products and you can't sell anything it's if it's just a black box and you can't say that uh, how well we can trust and, and what is this doing and this is the problem with uh, neural networks that that we have to convince the buyer somehow that uh, it is fair and there is no bias and and it works like we expect uh, this uh, Explainable artificial intelligence is easier with these traditional machine learning systems because you can go through each algorithm, you, you know what they do, they are based on certain statistics and uh, they are typically called as white box uh, implementations. But now these uh, neural networks, they are these post hoc models black boxes and we can't do similar kind of uh, examination. But people have started to do this kind of uh, separate tools or processes that, that somehow try to explain how it works. For example, this uh, shapely additive explanations uh, uh, method, uh, 
that is revealing the importance of each variable uh, uh, with the context of, of result. And this is just a starting point, not, not a comprehensive list. So I, I think that that part could be uh, a topic of, of another 30 minutes presentation. Okay, so let's go into conclusions. So, uh, in my opinion, and I suppose that this is a general opinion, we can really increase the amount of automation using these artificial intelligence methods. Uh, we can enable quite a lot of new uh, applications, uh, some of them are listed here, so smart cities, agriculture, transportation, climate, disaster management, uh, etc. And now actually we have to hurry because those fields are interested in those applications and we'll start to develop them or are already developing them just using uh, spatial data. But it's also opportunity for us to, to enhance our uh, portfolio to, to uh, not only produce data, but also forward in, into this kind of applications. Uh, this deep learning thing has changed a lot, this field, and we really should check all the possibilities and keep our eyes open to other fields, what they are doing, what we can take from there and develop our own methods. Because there are so many new possibilities that most likely we can't even imagine all the possibilities yet. So keep your eyes open and, and do not be afraid of neural networks. They are not that scary at all. For you, sir, they actually look very easy. So you just train that is a difficult part. And then you wait. You don't know, have to know anything about forward propagation or backward propagation. It's, it's a black box and computer is doing everything. And then you can just start to utilize it. But we need to really pay attention uh, to our input data. And, and for us, we have to create such data that we know that is suitable uh, for this kind of systems. And then we have to take care that results are consistently uh, good quality results. So thank you. I hope this uh, illustrated a little bit this field. Hello, Petteri Randa from Upiku Oy. Uh, I would like to uh, ask if you know about uh, the uh, current use of transformers for geo geospatial data, like uh, convolutional neural networks, 3D CNNs, uh, convolutional LSTMs, those are present, uh, have been present already, but how about those transformers for spatial data? I haven't seen much, uh, perhaps more recent scientific papers might have used them. Uh, potential is good, but again, uh, it remains to be seen how, how reliable those are just for our cases. That's always the main question in, in our case. They might create something uh, nice looking. Okay, okay. No, no other questions. Is, is there questions in chat? I can't really see from here. <laughs> but I might just ask, uh, like in, in general, do you, do you better think that, um, well, these new technologies, artificial intelligence, and, and so what you have been talking here, do you see that these are 
somehow revolutionary for, for the spatial data production and spatial data usage in the future, or even now. Yes, sure, because uh, if people can utilize automation, the, the need of data will increase exponentially. And that is really uh, our concern, because uh, there will be some applications that re uh, normal maps and, and 3D models, they are not enough for their applications because artificial intelligence is capable to do much more, but it requires really accurate uh, source data. So we, at some point, we will have to increase uh, the accuracy of our products to meet all demands. There's uh, one question online. Um, your opinion, Petri, what AI machine learning related skills should GIS experts in state organizations and cities now develop to be both able to stay up to date and develop operations? Well, uh, I recommend that uh, everybody tries once uh, how it works. You don't have to know everything about uh, the contents, but as I told, the practical part is not that difficult that you think. It is easier. It is laborious work, perhaps, but then you get the idea how it works and how it doesn't work. So, um, and then you should have some kind of uh, understanding what is possible and what is not possible. If somebody would like to provide you a, a product that you immediately know that it can't work, then you should have some kind of clue uh, that, that most likely it won't work. So thanks once more a lot for Petri. Let's give a hand. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, and then I think it was Jere Raninen uh, next giving a presentation, and then we go more into into details what we have been doing in National Land Survey in practice with with these tech techniques that that Peter Renholm just told us about. Jere, floor is yours. Thank you. So my name is Jere Raninen. I have a Masters in Computer Science from University of Eastern Finland. And I've been working in the previous Atma project as well as this AI for TDP project. And in uh, uh, this presentation, I'll be talking about uh, how to use our AI results in practical use. So the outlines, first I introduce uh, this project and a bit about the previous project. I'll talk about the method that we've been using, a um, little about the results, challenges, and further applications that we have uh, been testing a bit, and finally conclusions. So on the image, you can see uh, building predictions as yellow, and topographic database buildings as red. And in this project, we have used an algorithm to try and find better position and rotation for the topographic database buildings using the AI buildings. And you can see these uh, moved buildings with the blue color. Uh, so the demand for precise spatial information has been increasing due to innovations like location-based services, mobile mapping, and autonomous driving. And to meet these escalating needs, uh, we need to refine the accuracy of the National Land Survey's topographic database. And this project, AR for TDP, aims to use AI to refine the accuracy of the database. And we are mainly focusing on buildings and water courses. And in this presentation, I'll be focusing on the buildings. And we use the deep learning solutions from the previous Atmo project uh, that are buildings obtained from through orthophotos to improve the spatial accuracy of the topographic database. Uh, 
Uh, next slide, please. Um, the objectives of this AI for TDP project is to enhance the accuracy of the building vectors in the Pukrep database and accommodating the need for new era data accuracy. Um, we need to continue use, utilizing the AI methods and the outputs from the previous Atmo project and apply the AI techniques in, in practical use by improving the accuracy of the building vectors. And about the metallurgy. So first, the unit that we use for building prediction produces the building uh, polygons from two of the photos. And we have built this algorithm that uses the unit poly buildings as well as the topographic database buildings to enhance the spatial accuracy of the topographic database buildings. The algorithm gives uh, refined positions and rotations for buildings from the topographic database. Uh, that are inaccurate in these cases and it addresses the inaccuracies and improves the spatial accuracy of these moved and rotated buildings. Um, here's a bit about the algorithm. So it has five steps. Uh, first, we take the two building vector sets, uh, the AI builds and the topographic database buildings uh, next, there is the matching process where we find uh, corresponding building for every AI building from the topographic database buildings. And next, uh, we do semantic verification. So we check that the AI building and topographic database building are uh, similar to each other. Uh, we do this to avoid uh, mistakes from A AI buildings. Uh, because in some cases, if the building is very hard to see from the uh, image, uh, there can be some issues with the buildings. So this way we can avoid it by checking that the size and uh, the sizes are similar with the buildings and the buildings are intersecting with each other. And next, the important step, uh, spatial adjustment. Uh, in this step, we move the topographic database building to minimize the area difference between the AI building and topographic database building. And next, we rotate the move topographic database building to achieve the optimal al alignment. And we need to do these steps separately because if we both move and rotate the buildings together, uh, sometimes the minimizing the area the building can be rotated to find the uh, best position that is wrong, uh, wrongly rotated in, in the middle of the uh, AI building if the, there is a little difference with the building sizes. And finally, we assure that the quality is good by checking that the moved and or rotated building uh, is in, uh, taking a larger, larger area from inside the AI building than it, it did before moving or rotating building. And finally, the algorithm outputs all the adjusted buildings, uh, distances each building moved and rotated, and the area of each uh, moved building. And on the picture, you can see again that there is a large difference in the red area, that is the topographic database building, and the yellow area, that is the AI building, and then the uh, red building has been moved to the position of the blue building that you can see. Uh, here are some special cases we found uh, during developing the algorithm. So the first case is the building is missing from either the topographic database or a unit, the AI building, uh, it's the top left picture. So there is only the topographic database building in this case, that is the red area. Uh, next is a one-to-one -one case where there is one topographic database building and one unit building in the same area. That is on the top right picture. So there is one building from each side and these are the easiest cases to check. 
uh, on the bottom row, you can see one too many cases. So in this case, there are on the bottom left one AI building that is the yellow area, and inside it there are two uh, red areas that are the topographic database buildings. Um, in this case, it is very hard to find the optimal position that is actually good for the topographic database, so we mainly ignore these cases. On the bottom right, you can see a special case of this one-to-many case that we can reduce uh, these topographic database buildings that are in one-to-many cases if the topographic database is building is sharing one side with each other in the inside the unit building. So in this case, I hope you can see the two buildings that are inside the yellow area. So they are sharing the center line with each other. So uh, we can remove the center area and that way it will be a one-to-one -one case and the problem is reduced that way. And finally, when we produce the output, we also need to remember to add the uh, line there, so it will output also the multiple buildings that have been moved. So here's a little about the corrected buildings. So the topographic database buildings are corrected only if uh, the location or the rotation uh, of the topographic database building uh, deviates from the corresponding AI building, and we check this uh, in the first steps of the algorithm. And the size of the polygons in topographic database and the AI predictions need to be similar uh, to avoid uh, false predictions for bad cases in the topographic database. And we use the threshold of plus minus 20% in the size. And next is one polygon is not entirely contained within another. So if, for example, the topographic database building is completely inside the unit building, uh, we decide that it's already in pretty good position, so there is no need to correct the position at that point. And the polygons must touch each other uh, with a minimum of 5% overlap. And this way, we can check that the buildings are actually the same building. So we don't accidentally try and find a better position for a different building. And the minimum corrections we use are one meter distance and two degree rotation. So if the uh, building should be moved less than one meter, we won't move it. And if the rotation is very small, we won't rotate it as well. And that way we can avoid uh, very small changes. So the algorithm won't produce changes for almost every building. And here is an example of the topographic database buildings that are the red ones and the AI buildings that are the yellow ones. So you can see there are some differences with the shapes and the locations of the buildings in almost every case. And here we added the blue polygons that are the new uh, positions and rotations for the uh, topographic database buildings. So they are closer to the um, AI predicted buildings. And that way we can improve the accuracy of the topographic database using the uh, unit buildings. There's a bit closer look with all the buildings. So the red ones are from topographic database, yellow ones are from the unit, and blue ones are the new positions for the topographic database buildings. And here is one more example. So there are sometimes these uh, much larger uh, changes that you can see here. And these are pretty important to find. And the algorithm can find pretty good positions automatically for these buildings.
Next slide, please. Here are some test areas that we have been using over the year. So we are we have been using a lot of different areas from all around the Finland to see uh, how the algorithm can uh, work in different parts of Finland and see if there are some different cases around the country. And some of the areas are smaller than the others and the smaller areas were mainly from the city centrals. So we will find as many buildings as possible. So there are totally 11 test areas that we have been using. And here's a little bit about the results. So the algorithm outputs were evaluated throughout the project from different test areas. And we iteratively uh, changed the algorithm based on the feedback that we got from the evaluations. And one of the first feedbacks uh, was that the algorithm gives way too much, uh, way too many uh, small changes that are unnecessary in most cases. Uh, so initially it provided 20 to 30 percent of the buildings that were corrected from the, the whole test area. And based on that, we added the restrictions for the small changes and uh, the areas overlaps and such for the algorithm to give better results and focus mainly on the uh, cases where there were some actual changes. And after the tests and modifications, uh, it now achieves a more refined correction rate and approximately it gives around 10% of the buildings in the test areas now. And the final results are currently under evaluation uh, by the analyst experts. And the feedback has been pretty positive so far. And here are some challenges uh, in the project. So there are differences with the buildings, uh, shapes and sizes uh, between the AI and topographic database. And the error can be in both cases. So there is no like good ground route that we can trust one or the other. So uh, we try to skip these very hard cases. Um, there are some errors in the AI buildings and it's hard to uh, try and manage the inaccuracies and errors in the AI-generated building vectors. And finally, the one-to-many cases that we can't reduce to one-to-one -one cases uh, were very hard to find the good position for each of the buildings in one uh, unit building. So finally, we decided to skip these cases as well. So we won't provide any mistakes with the algorithm. And here are some further applications that we have been testing at the end of the project. So we can identify the missing buildings from topograph database. And that way we can detect the buildings that are identified by the AI but are absent in the topograph database. And we can give hints about these buildings that maybe they should be added to the topography database. And we can identify demolished buildings from topography database. So these are buildings that are in topography database, but are absent in the AI generation. And these can be demolished or uh, somehow disappeared from the actual images, but are still in the topography database. So the missing buildings uh, can be found by comparing the topographic database buildings and unit buildings. And we tested these uh, missing buildings in Oulu and Uvascular areas. And in Oulu, we found 209 missing buildings and in Uvascular, 425 missing buildings in the 144 square kilometer areas. Under the picture, you can see the vascular area. Like this. 
Uh, here's an example of the uh, missing buildings. So the pink areas are found by the unit, but are uh, missing from the topography database. So it's there are mainly pretty small buildings, but uh, there are cases of uh, larger buildings as well. And these are mainly uh, recently built buildings. And here is another example from a different area. And then about the demolished buildings. So in this case, we compare the topography database with the AI buildings in a uh, different way to find the topography database buildings that are not inside the AI buildings. Um, there are many false positives of buildings the AI missed. Um, these can be buildings that are very hard to note, uh, notice from the aerial images that are under trees or very heavy shadows mostly. And this was also tested in the same Oulu and Jyväskylä areas. And in Oulu, it provided 3,261 buildings marked as demolished, and in Jyväskylä, 2,253 buildings marked as demolished. But uh, in topography database, uh, these were actually mostly like real buildings, but these were uh, smaller buildings that were uh, outside of the central area and were mostly um, under trees or shadows that you couldn't see uh, from the area limits. But still, these were helpful based on the uh, preliminary uh, results. And there are some examples of the demolished buildings. So the red buildings are again from topography database and the yellow ones from the AI. And the pink ones are the demolished buildings in this case. So you can see that in these cases, the buildings are actually missing from the pictures. And here's a bit larger image and here you can see that there are actually some real buildings in there as well and they are mainly under trees or very small buildings and finally the conclusions so in leveraging the AI to enhance the accuracy of topography database uh, this project has successfully produced an algorithm that utilizes both AI buildings and the topography database buildings to improve the positional accuracy of the topography database buildings. Uh, the algorithm corrects building positions and rotations, bridging the gap between AI predictions and topography database data. And beyond the corrections, the algorithm also identifies missing buildings and demolished buildings. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Yere. Um, we are slightly behind the schedule, so I think it's possible for you maybe to answer uh, some questions in the chat I saw, <laughs> maybe answer them there, and we can then probably we we'll really have some time uh, at the end of the seminar to, to go through the questions as well. So we shall continue with water course issues, which was, as Yere said, the other other thing we have been focusing in in the project. And Pyrrhi Ketonen will come and tell us about that. Thank you, Heli. Uh, I'm Pyrrhi Ketonen. I come from Finnish Geospatial Research Institute. So I'm working as a research manager there, and uh, I will begin for that reason uh, the, our presentations about the water course network detections and recognitions. Uh, I have been leading this work, but then uh, very soon Arsi and Christian will come and tell it the real results. Thanks also go to Justus Poutonen, who has worked as research assistant at the FGHO Info, and Tommy Heikkilä from Patipo, who has made digitizations to us. Next slide, please. Okay, it works here. Well, not currently. <laughs> I'll try for each slide. Okay, so. Uh, uh, two projects, ATMU uh, began 2021 and AI for TDP this year. Uh, this is the basic setting maybe by many of you seen already last year about how the 
uh, topographic uh, uh, data we currently have in the national topographic database and the uh, digital elevation model uh, don't currently fit very well together. And uh, particularly in the case of water courses, this is how, how the current situation is. So we are willing to enhance this in general. Okay, now, <laughs> now it works. Changing the slide. Um, these were the uh, works for this year for, for the hydrographic uh, detections. So first of all, advancing the means for water course detection that was already began last year in the ATMO project. And um, principally uh, recognizing ditches and small natural streams. Uh, and for the this year's developments, uh, type of some new types of areas were added. Uh, neural network architectures were a little bit tried in a different way, and uh, fuzzy modeling was added in a couple of phases of the recognition process. Uh, we added a punt detection for this year uh, because those uh, are some connecting features between uh, these other water courses that typically tend to be cut quite easily in uh, in the detection results. Uh, added some new day input data for that, for example, near infrared uh, images or layers actually inside the images, and then uh, uh, tried this uh, neural network architecture for detecting these small ponds. Um, we made data management uh, further, advanced the solutions there, and uh, also added new areas as uh, as as the um, a digitization to training and the label data so the validation data as well are really important for uh, for the detection results and uh, and this this also was continued in this project so once uh, 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 represented first in this presentation due to our timing plan, but water courses were, were the leading part of the work. We can say, yes, please, next. <laughs> Not changing this. Yep, okay, this is the general uh, overview of the uh, AI detection workflow. So we have our training data, input data, uh, the convolutional neural network itself in the deep learning framework, and uh, then some post-processing where this year particularly we were we found out this uh, prediction surface thresholding solution about which Christian will tell more later. And then in the end, of course, we need to assess the results, how much we get correct and wrong, wrong detections from the network. Uh, this is the UNET convolutional neural network architecture used in uh, both uh, uh, this ditch stream and bond detection work. I won't go into details of that, but it is based on uh, uh, resampling the data in similar way so that we get really many trials of this and really many forms of these, uh, of these uh, features to be detected. And then the figures, images can be compared uh, together in different scales and, and uh, different places. Um, Digitization was important, as I mentioned, and some uh, examples on this slide. I just want to give the word forward, so I don't tell so many things about this. We had about 60 square kilometers in our uh, trials from three different areas in quite different kinds of uh, places in Finland and different kinds of water, water course networks. And then you can read the digitization sources down there. Particularly, this relative topographic position is is important, which is which is the two uh, rightmost images on this slide, and also in the the middle figure on this slide, which basically shows uh, how much there are uh, elevation differences in the close uh, uh, surroundings of of any play any any point on the figure, and. Um, Actually, here you can. Ju I just mentioned that uh, you can see the problem problematics of water course uh, and particularly this pond digitization, whereas the natural water features they are not clearly etched, as as you know and as as can be 
seen here. And then even for the human digitizer, it's not clear where the bond ends and begins. And this made the task really challenging and we had to try many, many solutions. Uh, all right, let's go to the results and the actual network usage. Answer, please. Oh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. So I'm going to tell you about more about the results. Okay, better. So I'll talk, start with the input data sets that were used for the bond uh, neural network. So the raster ima images with different number of bands or layers that have been created by combining uh, different bands from uh, orthophoto layers and elevation model, model. And we created in total six different data sets, which I'm going to show a bit later what kind of data sets. And the resolution for each of those data sets is 0 0.5 x 0 0.5 square meters. Oh, yes, worked. And a little bit about the net neural network training. Uh, training data consisted of 78% of all data and validation data 22%. And the neural network was well trained for 100 epochs. And during the training, the well input tiles were cut from random locations. And of course, there were some augmentations like random rotations and mirroring to get some better results. At the end, there was a trained neural network model, which could be can be used at different areas to predict the water bodies using no, well similar input data sets. If you only need those. And then a little bit about the results and data sets. First about the data sets itself. As you can see, there are the six, one, six different, and first one is a kind of RGP combined with near infrared. The second one is similar, but we have added them to see if it would produce better results. Then we just tried with orthophoto on them, and also kind of similar with the false color orthophoto. Photo combinations like false color of photo and false color of photo with them. And lastly, we also tested normalized difference water index, which is kind of calculated from near infrared and green band. And if you have already looked at the values, you can notice two things. The end of work at worst of those all. And the five different what data sets, they have kind of similar values, which indicate, well, there's no best data set itself. But one thing that has to be taken into account, this shows how well the prediction of all water bodies went. So lakes, ponds, other things, it doesn't really tell that well how the smaller ponds were detected. And which is why we had to do, do some visual also checking. What was noticed was that larger ponds were quite well detected, not always, but as you can see in the right side image, uh, they were, but the smaller the ponds were, and for example, they were in a kind of hidden, for example, in forest, the harder they were to detect for the neural network to detect. But in, in, if the water bodies were larger, like lakes and in open, or open water, a open area environments, they were quite a far more easier to detect and the outline is far more robust. But of course, there are exceptions like if the water body is located at the swampy area, so the outlines are kind of pussy, so the detection the neural network had difficulties kind of finding the correct locations. And of course, there are some problems like false detections. It has problematic with the shadowy road areas and in case some rooftops are also were detected, and the most common is uh, forest areas, like the shadows of the forests, because they are kind of similar to the smaller pond areas. And a little bit about the further, what kind of further development we are uh, well should be tried. Uh, first, would be interesting to see how instead of using the current label data, use the only the outlines of the water bodies. How would that improve the results or, or not? And no. And also use additional data from more varied environments, because we noticed that there are different kind of environments. And if you combine two areas data, it might not actually improve. So those areas, but if you use regional areas, 
then just there they might produce a bit better results. Maybe. Or you can try to use all together and see what happens then. And of course, there's other neural network models and loss functions for bond, bond development that we didn't have time. And of more augmentation methods, the only current one we used were what were already implemented. And of course, lastly, finding more suitable assessment methods for results. As earlier said, the F1 score prediction values and recall, well, they didn't show how well the smaller points were detected. So we need more, met but better methods for those. That was my part, and Christian is coming to tell next about the water, water course network. Or <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you, Ansi. Uh, I think we are now in sketch, but we shall continue directly. Uh, and as Ansi, Ansi said, so so um, Christian Koski will then continue with water issues in a way, and about deep learning, I guess it was. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Welcome, Christian. <clears throat> okay. So hello, my name is Christian Koski, and I also come from the Finnish Geospatial Research Institute, and I will tell. Well, continue from where Pyrrha and Ansi left off and, and tell you more in detail about the water course detection itself. Okay, so, so well, Pyrrha touched on this, but our goal in the water course detection with deep learning is to, to develop methods that can then increase the automation of extraction of under five meter wide water courses uh, for the topographic database. And why it's under five meters, it's because the under five meter uh, water courses in the topographic database at the moment here are uh, line features and, and I uh, I guess in the future as well those will be line features but over five meter wide uh, those are polygon features so so we are focusing on the line features and and those are probably or those are the hardest of the water courses to, to detect uh, by far um, this Work actually already started in the Atma project two and a half years ago, and um, and that ended one year ago, and and we got quite okay results from the Atma already. So, uh, so the neural network could find uh, well around 77 percent of the labeled water co course pixels, but that's not uh, a very well good estimate of of how good the results actually are because on pixel level these predictions and then the label data doesn't always match perfectly on top of each other. So you get sort of a little bit uh, of an offset there and you get a lot of false uh, predictions based on that. And then also uh, a lot of these uh, or, or the vast ma majority of, of those water courses that weren't found were these kind of water courses that are very, very uh, unclear in these uh, input data. Uh, anyway, we found a lot of the ditches that uh, are missing from the from the current topographic database. So with this data, uh, uh, if we uh, we can hopefully increase the the um, the, the completeness of of the uh, ditch network and also uh, the positional accuracy because uh, what we find is actually quite. Uh, uh, the position of the, those water courses is quite exact in the middle of the water course, while in the current topographic database, there might be a small offset. Um, but the biggest challenge uh, in this result is that there's a lot of gaps in these water courses, and we need to find out how we can fill these gaps because this water course is, need to form uh, a network. So if, if uh, we have, for example, a road in the between, uh, there's a culvert underneath it and, and the water can flow there. We want to know that the water can flow uh, underneath that. Uh, and this same problem is when you have unclear data in the middle of a water course, and then that water course won't continue past that. Now in Atmo, we also had quite limited data available. We only had one kind of uh, one area, uh, 36 square meters, uh, square kilometers of, of uh, data. And, and that was something we hope to also uh, increase the data in this project. So, so in this project, uh, more concrete, what we did was we tested this with additional data from different terrain types uh, with more natural streams and wide water courses, which were quite scarce in this, this Atmo data. And then uh, we explored some new methods that we didn't try in Atmo 
and then we did some preliminary planning on how we should actually use this data, this uh, machine uh, or deep, these deep learning predictions uh, going forward. So this is uh, uh, the input and label data that we use. Uh, we used the elevation model in 0 0.5 meter resolution, which is generated from the five point per square, square meter point cloud. And uh, in the app, we tested a lot of different input layers, but this was found to be uh, by far the best. Um, and then these labels we do so that we have these digitized line vectors and we use a fixed 1.5 meter buffer for those. We rasterize that to the same grid as the input data is in. And, and basically, zero is then a non water course pixel, and one is a water course pixel. Uh, then we uh, divide that into training and validation data, depending on the test. Uh, we have different ratios. Uh, this is, in a nutshell, uh, the training. So, so we cut this 128 times 128 pixel tiles from these. Uh, random locations from this uh, from these uh, training data sets and then uh, we apply augmentations uh, mirroring and rotation so so when you apply this it's uh, basically uh, we can we can uh, get the maximum out of the data that we have and then we train and validate the the, the, the model until it stops improving and then after that it can be made predictions based on this input data only. So we started out with training with this new data from the Simoyaki area, which is uh, quite a different type of area from the Suonejoki area that we used in Atmu. So, so in the Suonejoki area, we had mostly uh, forested areas. In Simoyaki area, we have open areas, uh, lots of swamps. There are some forests as well there. In the Suonejoki area, we had uh, the whole area was basically covered in ditches uh, pretty much everywhere. While in the Simoyaki area, there are less uh, ditches, but then there is more natural streams, or at least longer natural streams. And those natural streams are quite different from the natural streams that were in the Suonejoki area. Those are a lot wider as well as longer. Uh, in the Suonejoki area, the natural streams that were a big issue there, is they were all, almost always very unclear in the input data, covered with forest and very narrow. Uh, what we found trying with this new data uh, was that it didn't actually, if we added that data to the, to the uh, Suonejoki data, the Simoyoki and Suonejoki data, uh, we got a worse result when validating for only the Suonejoki area, which was quite interesting. Uh, and then we tried the same thing for the Simoyoki area. So when we used just the Simoyoki area data for training and validated with the Simoyoki area, we got a better result than having the Suonejoki da data in the training and validating for the so Simoyoki area. So, so this would indicate actually that, that well, we, we should probably uh, try this with more different types of areas, but, but if this is the case, then the optimal model will actually be trained with only one type of data, and then it will make predictions for that type of, of uh, area. Oh, okay. So then we explored some new methods in the in the project. We tried a different architecture, attention unit, which has been found to work better for water courses in some case, but in our case, that didn't improve the results. And then we tried to take into account this uncertainty that we have in this uh, data. So in the label, we used a fixed width, but of course the water courses are not fixed width uh, in 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 reality. So so we tried to use these kind of soft labels. Uh, where instead of having a binary classification of zero and one, it could be anything between zero and one label values. Uh, that didn't work uh, very well either. In fact, uh, the model became very careful and the width of the, of the prediction results started to also vary, which is actually not a good thing in this case. Uh, then we tried, because this point cloud that we generate the, the, the elevation model from, it's not very evenly distributed. There are a lot of big gaps in between points. So we, we, we had this idea, okay, what if we say that, uh, or we weigh this, uh, this um, loss calculation. So when it compares the prediction to the, to the label data, uh, 
uh, and then makes adjustment to the, to the neural network parameters if it if we weigh those uh, each area based on how dense the point cloud is at that area would that help but actually what we realized is that then it just doesn't learn anything about those areas so it, it probably doesn't work that well so so really with these methods we didn't find any any improvement to the results well then the post processing has not been a a, a very sort of uh, big focus so far in AI for TDB and, and Atmo, but going forward, we need to to probably focus on that more. Uh, now, the vectorization itself isn't that uh, complex because, uh, or it, it's at least easier because these uh, predictions are usually fixed width uh, uh, due to also our, our label data being fixed width. So we get the center line uh, quite easily from these predicted results. Uh, you have to do some cleaning and things like this, but but it could be a lot harder if, if for example, the width was uh, varying in different parts. But these gaps are still the problem. Uh, but then we realized it's also a little bit how we use these predictions. So, so many gaps could be filled with these kind of lower uh, value predictions, which I will talk about more in the next slide, but also then we can enhance this this uh, water course network with other features, and we need to do this because there's sort of uh, gaps because of culverts and 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 these ponds and and things like this. So, uh, but but going back to these lower threshold predictions, so so we found that these are quite good. So normally. When we get a prediction from the network, we get the, the value is between zero and one, but it can be anything between zero and one. So it's basically how confident the network is that that pixel belongs to a water course. And and typically we have used this 0 0.5 uh, threshold. And, and we say that, okay, if the prediction is over 0 0.5, then it's a water course. If it's under 0 0.5, then it's not a water course. And, uh, and that works quite well, but we get these gaps. And the reason we can't just use the 0 0.1 uh, directly out of the network with the 0 0.1 predictions is that then we start getting a lot of extra stuff and the width of the water course starts changing a little bit. And 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 basically, if you have two parallel uh, ditches that, that run very close to each other, those start merging. So we get a lot of, uh, lot of also issues if we would just use the 0 0.1 threshold prediction, but if we use that, that together with the 0 0.5, we think we can actually connect these water courses much better. So this is something uh, once we get to the properly to the post-processing, uh, we will probably use also this 0 0.1 threshold predictions. Then we also did this little exercise with ANSI, uh, seeing how well the the ponds that are found with uh, or ponds and lakes which are found with the uh, AI recognition connect to these water courses and here we tried with both being sort of 0 0.1 threshold as well uh, and and we well as I already told is that that the larger ponds and lakes are found much uh, more easy and and that's also why they connect much easier but then we have a lot of these small ponds and and, and really uh, Sometimes it's difficult to also say is this pond in the middle of the water course, or is it actually just a wider uh, water course section? Uh, the, so, so I guess these wider water course sections weren't uh, included in the pond detection. So, so, so that's also why it doesn't find that kind of uh, features. Uh, but also, in general, these smaller ponds uh, are missing. So, so those are still the issue here mostly. But these larger connect actually quite nicely to the water courses. So in conclusion, uh, best results from validating these two areas, different areas, uh, was achieved with training with just the data from that type of area, which was, I think, an interesting result. And then also that these lower threshold water courses uh, and also this ponds uh, can be can be used to, to, to fill this gap in between these water courses. But then in the future, we need to focus more on the on developing these post-processing steps to get the actual vector data set. And, and then also validate or assess at least the, the 
how well our method works uh, towards that end result, which so far we have done very much on the sort of uh, visuals from the machine learning results directly or then the, the even the F1 score in some cases. Yeah. So that was all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christian. Uh, we are slightly behind the schedule, but let's have, let's have a short break here still, but we shall continue as scheduled 1435 with the next presentation. So it's something like five minutes breakish <laughs> here. Sorry, people online, there's coffee here. <laughs>
Hey, people, can we <laughs> continue our seminar, please? People, you will have time for coffee and speaking to each other. <laughs> uh, it seems that I can't be loud enough. <laughs> Thank you, Mika. That's a good one. <laughs> well, it's nearly Christmas. <laughs> Juha Karenen, can you tell them to come here? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Olli. <laughs> Thank you, Olli, for being loud enough. <laughs> okay, uh, we we shall continue and and try to try to be and and also end the seminar in schedule. Uh, next, we will go back to building issues after being slightly on the watercourse side <laughs> here before the break. Uh, we have Emilia Hattula joining us online and giving pre presentation remotely. So hopefully everything works just fine. So testing, testing, Emilia, can you hear us and can we hear you? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Wonderful, we can hear you nice and clear. Just the floor is yours. Great, thanks. So, hi all. My name is Emilia Hattula, and I have been working with building detection in the AI for TDV project. And unfortunately, I have to present remotely today as I have been in a flu and wasn't therefore able to come to the place today. But yeah, my topic today is the comparison of building detection in the forest environment using UNET for images and LiDAR data. So let's go quickly through the contents of this presentation. First, I go quickly through how we detect buildings in our project, and then I'll talk about what benefits and problems we have noticed with using LiDAR digital surface models for building detection, especially in the forest areas, and so example images. And next we will see a bit of comparison about two different unit performance in forest environment and the other unit uses images as input and the other uses 3D LiDAR data. And finally, there's some conclusions. So here's an image of the unit that we have been using for detecting buildings. We give it through autophotos, digital surface models and digital elevation models as input data and for training also building vectors. In our project, we have now been testing if we would get more accurate detected buildings with LiDAR DSMs. As until now, we have been using aerial DSMs for building detection. Also, the DEMs we have used are originally of 2 meter pixel resolution and then resampled into 0.25. 25 meter resolution. So at the same time, we have tested also uh, DEMs that were originally 0 0.25 meter pixel resolution already. And then we have also tested this 3D unit in our project that uses 3D LiDAR data as input. So I will so you a bit how it performed also.
And so building detection in forest areas can be quite challenging as trees and shadows make detecting the buildings hard. And we have used DSMs and DEMs as help for building detection. And the LiDAR DSM that we used in our test was last and only laser pulse data. And here are some benefits we have noticed in our tests before. Uh, we see some images of these situations. So firstly, building shape was often better detected with LiDAR DSM instead of aerial DSM. And false detections in forest areas were notably decreased if LiDAR DSM was used. And some buildings covered by trees or shadows were only detected if LiDAR DSM and the 0.25 meter DEM was used. So here you can see how the LiDAR DSM helped with detecting the building shape. Uh, the blue polygons were produced with LiDAR DSM. And you can notice that they follow the building shape much better than the white polygons that were produced with aerial DSM. And here in this slide, there's also examples of similar cases. For example, in the right image, the shadowed area has caused a falsely detected building shape if the aerial DSM was used. And the result was better with the LiDAR DSM. Next, here's some examples of buildings surrounded or covered by trees that were detected only with LiDAR DSM. And here in this slide is again a couple more of similar cases. Uh, then false detections in forest areas decreased if LiDAR DSM was used. Uh, in the smaller image, you can notice also a blue false detection with the LiDAR DSM. But if we use the more accurate 0.25 meter DEM to get, to get uh, with the LiDAR DSM, also that false detection disappeared. And in this slide, there is quite many examples of the false detections in the forest areas if we use aerial DSM. Then some buildings were detected only with, with LiDAR DSM and 0.25 meter DEM. And here we can see an example of that kind of case. And here in this slide also there's a couple similar cases. Next, we also noticed some problems with using LiDAR data. Um, some water areas had height problems. For example, for example, here in the lower image, where is the LiDAR DSM? We can notice that the river seems to be higher than the ground. And that has caused some false detections. And in the upper image, you can see the aerial DSM that has the correct height. And here you can notice also a lot of false detections related to the LiDAR data's water height with blue and pink color. But you can 
also notice some false detections in the forest invite that were produced if aerial DSM was used. Then another problem with using LiDAR data for our building detection was that some buildings were missing from the LiDAR data completely. And this can sometimes happen, for example, because of the rooftop material. And if the building was missing from the LiDAR data, it sometimes caused the building to, do, to be missed with the LiDAR DSM. Uh, here's a similar example with some buildings missing partly or completely from the LiDAR data and it has affected the building detection result. And in this example, the buildings are not missing from the LiDAR data, but the forest environment is quite hard for the AI model and the LiDAR DSM in this case haven't helped with finding those buildings covered by trees. And here we can see now some comparison between the image unit result when LiDAR DSM and 0.25 meter DEM is used and the 3D unit that uses the LiDAR data. Uh, blue vectors are the 3D unit result and purple vectors the 2D image result. And you can notice that if buildings have been missing from the 3D data, the 3D unit has missed those buildings entirely. The 2D unit on the other hand has been able to find those buildings with the help of the true autophotos it gets, though the LiDAR DSM that it also uses has been missing those buildings. And here you can see some other, another example where some buildings have been missing from the LiDAR data. And also, in some cases, the shape of the detected buildings was more accurate with the 2D unit. And it can be seen quite well with the left side image. And mm, so many buildings were missing from the LiDAR data, uh, the 2D unit performed well. And in some cases, <coughs> the 3D unit was able to find some forest buildings better than the 2D unit. For example, in this image, the, only the 3D unit has found those small buildings. And some conclusions about our tests. So we get noticeably less false detections in forest areas when we use LiDAR DSM for building detection from images. And there was some problems we noticed, which were the missing buildings from the LiDAR data and some falsely high water areas in the LiDAR DSM. <coughs> if we used images together with the LiDAR DSM, it's a bit more for forgiving than uh, if we used the 3D unit as with the help of the true autophotos, those missing buildings might still get detected. And finally, the result of our test was that the best combination of data for building detection 
was the LIDAR DSM and 0.25 meter DEM. Thank you for listening. The title of my master's thesis that was also done as a part of this project. Can you please change the slide? So a little bit about the background. So currently land use and land cover data is used quite extensively in the modern society and is very important since its usages ranges from administrative to scientific purposes. The topographic database is a important base for the land use and land cover data in Finland. However, it's currently monitored mostly manually, which is very time consuming and laborsome. This is why we wanted to test if deep learning could be used as a solution for making this pipeline more efficient. So first a bit about the methods. So the method for implementing deep learning into this process which we, there's a, there are a lot of them, but in this presentation, I'm going to focus on a post-classification method. So in post-classification, the two images that the changes want to be detected from are first classified into land use and land cover classes. And then those land use and land cover maps can be then used for change detection. So the deep learning in this is done for the classification of the images. And for testing, I've used images from 2020 and 2022. So we tested two different architectures, the Deep Lab version 3 and the UNET, both with a ResNet 50 backbone. The models are trained for with data from 2022. However, they were only trained for 80 epochs because of time constrictions. And since the data was only trained for the data of 2022, the, there was quite a large difference between the images from 2020 and 2022. And this is why I tested three different methods for increasing the classification accuracy. The first method was just testing with uh, inputting the image straight into the model. The second one was trying to histogram match the image to match the color values of the 2022 image. And lastly, using transfer learning to from a small area of the 2020 data to see if this improves the classification. And lastly, when the land use and land cover classification maps are constructed, these can be used for the change detection. So the change detection in this case works so that if the pixel has the same class value in both images, it has not changed. But if it varies, it will be outputted into the change map and the change map is then visualized by the new class, but also includes information about the class it used to be. So for materials, so the training data used was a land cover data produced by Scalgo in collaboration with Syke. And this was used then with corresponding true ortho photos that were made from aerial imagery from, for the area, and they were from 2022. The land cover data came in a raster format so this and the two orthophotos both had an image resolution of 25 centimeters. The training data originally included 10 classes, but were then merged into nine. 
and a total of 131 square kilometers from S point Helsinki were used. Then for validating the results, since we want to know if we find the right changes, the two different data sets were used. So the 2020 could be validated with the same type of data that was used for training. But since it's based on newer images, it could not be used for the 2020 data. And here a Helsinki metropolitan area land cover data by HOSU was used. And here we can see images of them side by side and also the nine classes that were included. So these were bare land, water, other paved, building bare rock, shallow vegetation, dense vegetation, field and road. And as we can see, they do differ a bit. The Hoasu data has like broader roads as well as it didn't have, the Hoasu data comes in 14 different shapefile layers and none of them was like, did explicitly only include dense vegetation. It had four different layers for canopy. So these were then combined for dense vegetation. So these kind of differences do then affect the validation of the results. And here you can see the test area that was used. It's approximately a small nine square kilometer area from Kauskvahti Espo. And also you can see the true ortho photos on the side. So we can see that the 2020 image is a lot darker than the 2020. And this is why there were some issues with classifying the 2020 image. Then some of the evaluation metrics used. So for training, there's the training loss, validation loss, accuracy and dice score. And for each class, there's a precision recall and F1 scores. And for validating the model on the test area, confusion matrices were then constructed. Here are a bit of the numerical results. We can see that when training for the AD epochs, the numerical values are very similar. The deep lab outperformed the unit by pretty much only a percentage of them. They're very close that the overall accuracy is around 88% and the dice score is a percent lower. And then we can see from the right hand side table, there's the F1 values for each class which then demonstrates that the performance isn't really unified across every class. There's some classes that do like get better results, for example, water building, that's vegetation and field, where water has an F1 score of 0 0.99, from which the best is one. However, like bare land and bare rock, especially have lower scores. Bare rock is often then covered by canopy, which can affect, of course, the classification accuracies. Then we can look at the results a bit closer. So from here, we can see that the predictions do look quite similar to the ground truth data. So the best performing classes follow quite good along the F1 scores. So they are water, dense vegetation, building and field whereas the worst performing are bare land and bare rock. Then we can also see that the model has some issues along the shoreline where the reeds make it hard for the model to detect a accurate shoreline, as well as the unit does like have a bit problems with road connectivity. It leaves sometimes with the small roads, some gaps in between, but overall it does follow quite well the ground truth and then we can look at the 2020 classification results. So here are the overall results with the different tests. So in the upper row, we can see the original image, the histogram matched image and the ground truth. And then we have in the second row, the output from the deep lab and in the lowest one from the unit. And in the first column, there's the direct outputs, the second, the histogram matched and in the last, the fine tuned. And here we can see that the directly putting the image into the model creates quite a lot of false detection, especially around water. Since the water is so light, it's often detected as either shallow vegetation or field. When histogram matching, these false detections do decrease, but there's still some in the water and especially in the unit, the 
shadows become so dark in the forest that it takes them as water, which is of course not either good. But then we can see with the fine tuning that the false detections in the water disappear pretty much completely. And also the issue with the dark forests. And here's a closer look of the results. So here we can also see that the ground truth resembles the output quite a lot. Of course, the ground truth again has a bit different characteristics, but it follows the principle that they do exhibit like same patterns. And here we can see that the accuracy now is a lot closer to the 2022 predictions, however, a bit lower which is probably because of the small area used for the fine tuning. But here we have again, there are quite similar problems that with the 2020 classification that some of the roads leave some gaps in between. But overall, it did improve quite a lot from the direct output. And here are also some numerical values for the test area. So the confusion matrices, the most important values here are across the diameter, where we can see how many pixels are correctly predicted. And these follow quite in hand, hand in hand with the F1 scores, where the water building, field and dense vegetation are the best detected classes. And here we can also see that when bare rock is often detected as dense vegetation, which is probably because it's covered by canopy. In the 2020, the results aren't as reliable for the 20, as for the 2022 because of the disparities between the data, but it does exhibit quite a similar pattern to the 2022. And then we can look a bit about the change detection results then that were derived from the land use and land cover classification maps. And here we quite clearly notice that the change detection is very dependable on the classification accuracies. So the best performing, best detected classes, of course, produce the best change detections. And since the these kind of results do get affected by misclassifications, and there's sort of problems like if the detection like differs by only a couple of pixels, it can leave these kind of edges around objects that have not changed. So it does include a lot of noise that aren't necessary. However, it is able to detect like most of the prominent changes. For example, in buildings and roads, it's quite good at detecting these large changes. So to conclude, at least according to this test, we could say that the Deep Lab version 3 did outperform the unit by slightly. This, of course, can be then changed when, if chained to convergence. And an effective method seems to be that if there are large disparities between the color values in the images, if we do not have training data for those type of images, transfer learning can be used for a very small area to tackle this issue. And the change detection really did exhibit that Accurate training data is very crucial when working with these kind of things, since the misclassifications then get enhanced in the change detection. Of course, this could then be tackled in the future by creating a model that would detect the changes directly from the directly in the model without having to do the classifications. However, this would then need that training data of this type would be constructed, which is very hard and laborsome, especially when working with nine classes. But it might be something we will test in the future. And this was all for me, so thank you. Thank you so much, Emilia, for, for this. Uh, and next we will have Emily Peterson, not Emilia, sorry, <laughs> there are so many Emilias here. Uh, Emily Peterson uh, talking about using AI models on open source platforms. Welcome. Thank you. So, I'm Emily Peterson and I'm a master's student in Aalto University and I'm doing my master's thesis 
on uh, for national land survey about how to use the AI models in the open source platform. And here are my contents. First, I will tell about the background of the study and then uh, something about deep learning model deployment and then about some tools and methods and finally some preliminary results and discussion. And as a background, the NLS, NLS updates the topographic database and roads, road addresses and buildings are some of the most important classes. And roads are updated continuously whenever there is credible data and buildings are updated yearly. And some of the information sources are stereo images, LIDAR, and governmental agencies and municipal agencies. And aim of the study is to research the in integration of the models into the production workflow and to use deep learning for topographic data quality improvement. And the models used in this study are models, pre-trained models from the Atmo project. So unit model for building segmentation done by Hattula and road vecnet model for road surface and edge segmentation done by Raninen. And then about deep learning model deployment. So there are some general steps for model deployment in the production. First, you have to pre-process the data and then run the model inference. So predictions from the model. And then some post-processing, which might consist of vectorization, usually, and then some regularization. And of course, when we want good data, there has to be some quality assurance and evaluation. And then you can update the, the, the topographic database using the processed results. Or you can use them as a hint as well. And there are two ways. You can either do it remotely, so the input data is somewhere on a remote server or a private cloud, and the data is processed on very large scale. So there are production areas and there's hundreds of square kilometers. And first you do the pre-processing steps and then run the model inference and then some post-processing. And all those results are then turned into final vector products. And of course, there's going to be some evaluation and quality assurance. And then there is local deployment. So you have the input data in some uh, data interface, for example, VMTS. And then you run the model predictions for a much smaller area, for like nine square kilometers or something like that. And all those results are then locally post-processed into final vector products. And then there is going to be some evaluation and quality assurance, like for the remote model as well. And now I'm going to go through the tools. So the most obvious choice is to use one of the popular deep learning frameworks. There are several. and there have features like building models, training models, model inference, and they usually allow construction of custom layers and also custom modules. And some popular choices for Python are PyTorch, TensorFlow, and Keras. But there is no built-in geospatial functions in them, so you have to implement them yourself. And then there is this ONNX ecosystem. ONNX stems for Open Neural Network Exchange, and it's a format to export and import machine learning models between frameworks. And the, uh, the idea is that you can build and train your network with your framework of choice, and then export as ONNX. Then you can run it either with this ONNX runtime or convert to framework specific format. And there are a wide variety of tools to modify neural network structure, even without pre-training. And then there is 
tools for inference and training models. And there are also, also some other tools that can help in this process. Like Atlas Toolbox is a deep learning Python library for remote sensing research. And it has features like model training, pre-trained models, predefined remote sensing datasets, model inference, and it supports several frameworks. But the drawback is that new models and datasets are quite cumbersome to add. And then there's OTBTF, which is a extension for rather popular remote sensing software or fail toolbox. And its features is that it, it uses TensorFlow and TensorFlow saved models. And you can do, do model training, model inference, and it has this block-based processing for saving memory. But its drawback is that it only supports TensorFlow saved model files, and there is no Windows executable, only offered as a Docker container. And then there's Deepness. Uh, Deepness a, is a deep learning remote sensing plugin for good GIS. And its key features is that it uses those ONNX models. And it has inference for segmentation models, detection models, super resolution models, and regression models. And it supports basically all GDAL raster formats. And it also has this kind of processing blocks to save memory. There is also built-in vectorization for segmentation models, which uses find contours from OpenCV library to produce polygons from segmentation mask. But its drawbacks is, is that model type support is quite limited. And there is only one normalization standardization scheme. And there is no support for multitask models, so no mu multiple outputs. And there is no training feature except for training data export. And on the right, you can see the interface of the plugin. And also some other pictures of the plugin interface. There is processing parameters for setting the resolution and uh, selecting the classes you want to output. And then something about the methods. So I have to modify the deepness a little bit because there were some certain features missing. And I implemented raw segmentation mask output, raw image output, and support for C-score standardization. And the original developer was kind enough to add support for models where input and output mask sizes differ from my request. And then some methods. For the building model, the model was the unit model by Hattula. And its inputs are RCP, true ortho in 25 centimeters spatial resolution, then DSM and DEM. And it outputs lockets for the background and the buildings. And I added the softmax to the model ar architecture because it, it works much better with the deepness plugin. So it produces, no, norm, produces a normalized probability output mask. And then, uh, Pre-processing consisted of G-score standardization for the RGP channels, and the DEM was interpolated to 25 centimeter resolution from two meter DEM, and DSM and DEM were divided by the standard deviation. Th those channels were divided, and then. Uh, on tile level, the combined mean of DSM and DEM was subtracted from the channel value. And <clears throat> processing consisted of just model inference for a map sheet in deepness and some post processing, just calculating the standard like metrics for segmentation. And the reference used was rasterized 2D building polygons from the topographic database. Uh, experiments with the road model. Well, the model was road vacnet model by Raninen, and it, 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 its inputs are just RGP, either ortho or true ortho, both can be used, and in 50 centimeters spatial resolution. 
and it outputs sigmoidal probabilities for the background and the road surface. I removed the road at segmentation branch because I didn't need it. And it quickens up things. And the pre-processing is just resampling 25 centimeter cell size raster to 50 centimeter because I didn't have the 50 centimeter available. And processing is just model inference in deepness. <laughs> this post-processing is quite cumbersome, but I had this thresholding where I used both channels for calculating the segmentation mask. Uh, then I created a road network using digitized fraction effect tool from the uh, network GT plugin, uh, which makes uh, um, networks from segmentation masks. And then I calculated clusters for the network using clusters from the network GT plugin. Then the segmentation mask was polygonized and filter, I filtered out the background. And then I calculated intersection of the reference road vectors with the polygons and compared the intersection lengths by road class with the reference before intersection. And it, I noticed that it was mentioned, but the TDP road vectors were my reference. And I calculated the standard metrics and then this lengthwise completeness using the length, length stats, which were the step six from the last slide. And comparison of, of, of clusters with the reference corresponding to step three on the last slide, previous slide. Oh, oh there you go. And for the buildings, I got this kind of F1 scores and precision recall. It was quite well in line with Emilia's results, so Emilia Hattula's results. And for some visual observations, there are some buildings missing. Yeah. And some of the parts of the buildings are missing, so there can be pieces missing in the middle of the building. And the shapes of the buildings are generally quite blobby. But the shapes are still more detailed than the reference because the reference is kind of a simplification of buildings. And some preliminary results for the roads. Here are the like standard metrics, but these are quite bad because the model was not fully trained. And then there is there is this lengthwise completeness, which tells something about which classes from the topographic data space were uh, captured by the model. And it basically tells that if there is like class two or three, there are quite important classes, and they are detected quite well, except for the two um, A, which is a bit worse. But then there is like track, which is less important and I think it was not even trained with the model anyway so this is kind of expected and some visual observations there are quite big gaps so there's the pink is the segmentation result and yellowish is the ground truth and roads near parking lots are particularly hard to detect but the shapes are nice and then those clusters show that those where those, those gaps appear. So if the thing is connected, if the network is connected, then it's has the same color. So if there is large area with the similar color or same color, then it's connected somehow. And on the right, you see, see how it should look like. So there's still quite a bit of work to do. So as a discussion, the results for the building model, they are already quite promising, but there has to be some work to do with post-processing into production quality vectors. And I need to experiment with different data. But the roads, they have large gaps and model needs training. 
vectorized centralized are too simplified for now. There has to be some other simplification method to use. And still the network topology is quite consistent with the reference if you exclude the gaps there. So that's pretty much it. Do you have any questions? And thank you. Ranta Upigo again. Uh, how did you find the performance? I, I believe you use deepness with cookies locally. Yeah, I did. Yeah. So how did you find the performance? Did you like pay attention to it or were you just focused on like uh, doing the things, getting the metrics and getting uh, it to run? Do you, do you mean like performance in terms of processing time or? For example, yeah, uh, when you said that you processed a whole map sheet. Yeah, uh, a nine square kilometer map sheet was processed process it in like maybe less than 15 minutes. Okay, so for a larger area. That, yeah, on a standard laptop, yeah. no, nothing nothing like fancy. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Amy. I think we, we shall have our last presentation and then we have still time for questions also for Emily if needed. So now I want to invite our project and, and team leader Ling Su here and, and uh, Ling will sum up <laughs> our AI work in National Land Survey. Here you go. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, I'm uh, Ling Li Zhu from Pati Irma National Land Survey of Finland. At the moment I'm leading AI team uh, to develop uh, deep learning solutions for topographic database in the National Land Survey of Finland. So, so the past uh, few years, we have experienced uh, two AI projects. Uh, Autumn project was uh, lasted for two years, and the AI for TDB project just uh, happened for during this year. This autumn project, this uh, ATMU means from uh, advanced technology for national topographic map updating. So this project was uh, co-funded by the Ministry of Finance and also the National Land Survey of Finland. And uh, this project focused on buildings, uh, what courses and the roads. Here is the overview of the training data set that we have used for this project for uh, building detection, what courses detection, and also road detection and the change detection. This is the overview of the, our deep learning solutions uh, during this project. For building detection, we use the unit and we trained with uh, two, uh, two also photos building vectors, DEM and the DSM. And finally, we got uh, building outlines from the network. For the road detection, we trained with uh, also photos and uh, uh, road vectors. And finally, we got both road edges and the surfaces. Because in this model, we have used multitask learning techniques. So we were able to produce not only one output, but multiple output. Then for, for what, what course detection, we use a half meter LiDAR DEM in the trained in the model. And then, then also we got segmented what courses. For change recognition, so we trained with the choice of photos and the labels with the changed, changed areas. And then we got polygons from the changed areas as the output. So most of our uh, results have been evaluated, but uh, uh, only what courses, because we still continue during this year to, to, for the development. And also we will continue uh, this development for next year as well. So here is the overview overview of the results that we got from the autumn project. For the buildings, we, we got uh, uh, accuracy up to 97.9% uh, accuracy, according to the, our expert evaluation in, from National Land Survey. 
then for the road detection, we, we got a very uh, promising uh, result, but uh, because we didn't get the, uh, this value, this number of the accuracy, so we just uh, say the result was uh, very good, uh, quite promising. And for the change, change detection, and we found 96% of changes uh, from our network. So that was the autumn project. Uh, it, it was uh, uh, happened during the 2021 and 2022. Then during this year, we had the AI for TDB project. So AI for TDB project means the artificial intelligence for topographic database accuracy enhancement. So this project was uh, co-funded by the Ministry of Agriculture and the Forestry and the, also the National Land Survey of Finland. So we focused on the buildings uh, correction and also the what course uh, detection. Here I want to show you what's the, the relations between these two, uh, two projects. So uh, autumn project, uh, we started from uh, to also photos production, we use the we use the uh, area images, uh, orientation parameters, and the lidar data and the what core what bodies to produce the true also photos, uh, and also we got the imager uh, based DSM, and together with the building vectors and the DEM, we trained those data in the unit model. So that was the, the uh, autumn project regarding the buildings. We trained a unit model and uh, to be used in the AI for TDB project. So uh, during this AI for TDB project, we used the two also photos, DSM and the DEM to make prediction from the AI buildings, uh, to make prediction from the unit model and to get the AI buildings. And those buildings have been checked with uh, together with the two also photos and made building correction. So after correction, we still uh, use those uh, uh, corrected uh, ve building vectors to be trained in the unit model to enhance the model performance. And during this project, we uh, developed a method uh, to correct the topographic database building vectors by compare the TDB building vectors with the AI buildings, as uh, today uh, Yeri has uh, presented the more detailed how it works uh, during this project and the how, how the algorithm works. And then after uh, we make this uh, correction, uh, like uh, the shift and the rotation of the buildings, and then we, we had this quality control which means we compare those results together with the two also photos and also TDB uh, vectors to be sure that the result is correct. So after that, we deliver the result to our uh, expert team, like a mapping team, uh, to, to be checked and get feedback from them. And then we uh, uh, improve our algorithm. So the, that was the interactive uh, process during this project. So this is an overview of the test areas that we have done during this year. So 11 areas have been tested and the most of results have, have been delivered to our mapping team to get feedback and to uh, improve our algorithm. And uh, besides those uh, uh, building correction, we also made a lot of uh, testing during this uh, during this year for the building detection. As uh, Hadula, uh, Emilia Hadula presented about the test result. So here is the overview of uh, the test that we have done. So we tried to find the best and the more, most accurate uh, result for the building detection. So we trained uh, 3D unit with uh, only LiDAR data and get the building, detected the buildings and compared with the 2D unit with the choice of photos and the image DSM, DEM. 
And here I want to mention this uh, TEM with uh, uh, this black text means the two meters LIDAR TEM uh, we got from, uh, you, you can also download from our open source uh, from National Land, Land Survey of Finland. And then we resampled those to 25 centimeters TEM. Because during this testing, all of our data sets have been used with uh, 25 centimeters resolution. So we had, had to uh, resample those two meters DM to, to 25 centimeters DM. And you can imagine it, it was not very accurate, this DM. And then with this uh, red color with the 25 centimeters DEM, uh, that was uh, directly produced by uh, our LIDAR team and directly from the, this LIDAR data set. So that was the differences between this normal uh, black uh, this, uh, text DEM and also red uh, text DEM. So we compared this uh, 2D unit uh, result and tested the different uh, DSM, for example, tested the uh, image-based DSM and with, uh, compared with the uh, LIDAR DSM. And also we also tested with the uh, LIDAR DSM and uh, plus 25 centimeters DEM to produce uh, the result and compare with the 3D unit result as well. So all uh, results have been compared and we found that uh, uh, the combination of uh, this uh, 2D unit with uh, true also photos, uh, LiDAR DSM and 25 centimeters DEM got the best uh, performance. And besides this, we also had uh, uh, just now, Emily had uh, made uh, this presentation about how, we, how to use our AI model for the productions. So we uh, tested this uh, deep learning, the deepness plugin in QGIS with uh, uh, our AI building model and the AI road models. And also, Emilia has uh, just now presented about uh, monitoring the changes for the land cover land use. So those also during this project we, we, uh, we have tested. And uh, in overall, for this project, uh, AI applications for building data in topographic database, we found that uh, uh, this AI generated buildings can be used for TDB building location correction, for TDB uh, missed buildings, and also demolished buildings. So far, those uh, have been um, proved that uh, that. Uh, uh, that was uh, useful for, for our applications. Then regarding what courses, and today we had a uh, few, uh, two presentations regarding this, and uh, here is a small summary of, of this topic for, for during this year, because uh, uh, what courses have been, uh, this detection method have been developed during the autumn project, and now, uh, during this year, we had a uh, lot of approve, improvement. We got uh, uh, quite uh, uh, quite a lot. We we got more digitizations uh, and the labels from the what courses and also from the ponds, especially for these uh, forest areas. And uh, we have tested uh, different method for the like uh, fuzzy modeling. Uh, for what course recognition and also pond, pond uh, CNN uh, training and also testing and what course detection uh, test and also the combination of the what course and the ponds. During the autumn project, we have focused on only what course detection, but uh, uh, because uh, there were quite many these uh, gaps between between uh, the what courses. So during this project, we added these uh, ponds to be in between uh, to, to connect the what courses. So the result have been improved, but still I think uh, the challenge remains to fill the gaps in what courses. So, so this development will continue for next, next year as well. All right, so this is the kind of uh, take away points uh, 
during these uh, two projects. So first of all, uh, we can see for the for the AI models, uh, the quantity, quality, and the diversity of the training data are very important to make model performance better. Second one, um, if you don't have any training data from the beginning, so you're starting with a small but high quality training data, and then later you can refine AI model predictions, like you can correct the AI predictions and then to retrain the model to get the more training data. So this way is the most efficient way for, for getting more training data. And then the inside three, uh, regarding the buildings, uh, there are some scenarios that we cannot avoid. To There are some errors always comes. For example, the temporary structures in the construction zones might uh, be detected as, uh, as buildings. Uh, we cannot uh, avoid this uh, situation and also underground the buildings may be absent from the AI predictions. And then the last one, not the least, the last one, overall, overall our AI project significantly improved uh, TDB building quality, particularly in identifying missed and demolished buildings. And the AI recognized changes serve as valuable indicators for, for the mappers. So that's all from me. And uh, Thank you and Hiva <laughs> Yaulua. Thanks and yeah. And I want to thank you, uh, thank you, uh, uh, our team, everybody. Great work and also uh, thank you uh, for the organization from Party and the National Land Survey for the uh, support for for the uh, this AI projects and also thank you for your <laughs> supporting to to give us these uh, places. For, for this uh, great seminar. And uh, also thank you from Alto University, Bentley. <laughs> thank you very much for, for your support as well. So, oh, th just uh, thank you everybody for, 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 uh, to, to, for us to, to get the best result and, uh, and uh, for, for this project. And also thank you, this is CSC, uh, we, we had this, uh, uh, high performance computing from the CSC that was a, a great support for us and we we were uh, need your support in the future as well so thank you very much and and thank you lingli also for all the great work you have been been doing here for for these uh, two projects we have had in in Geo AI for the last three years. Uh, we now have some time for questions. I, I think some of you are already answering some questions online. Okay. Uh, and first of all, I want to apologize. There seems to be, there, there has been some difficulties online. Uh, we, we don't know why, and, and, and but these things happen when you have a hybrid seminars. Uh, but but hopefully everything has gone well after all. You might have learned here that we are more into you know deep learning and spatial data than to learn how to run seminars smoothly. So this is probably the reason. But now we have a few minutes for for questions. If there are any questions on the floor here. But we have all the presenters still here available to to answer your questions, or then we can pick some questions online if if you mean go. can pick some some of the questions up there. Uh, there's a question from Teemu Leskinen. Uh, a useful application for NLS Finland could be the simple detection of and marking of areas where. With the sufficient probability, nothing interesting building drones has happened since the last aerial photography or survey. This would produce the need for manual walkthrough in the stereo mapping. I think there's uh, more comment, but if somebody wants to add to this. Anyone? <laughs> I, I can try to answer, but but overall the, the point in, in why we have been 
uh, having these these GeoAI uh, projects in National Land Survey is is basically well the data accuracy, of course, but but also as as for example Peter Hall mentioned that that automation and lots of data. Those are the two questions we nowadays have a national uh, lidar and aerial image programs where we get image data from the whole of Finland in in uh, in the three year interval and lidar data in six year interval. And we just can't manage to deal with all that data manually as we have done before. So uh, this is one of the the kind of uh, drivers to to also uh, dig into to AI and other new technologies. So in a way, uh, all the solutions that will help our mappers in the future to to like update the topographic database more fluently are are up to the table <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Thank you. Very interesting presentations. Um, I'm curious, like looking at the full package, basically, because we now heard a lot about the analysis of the data, but I'm curious maybe to hear from Lingli, like, or any of the presenters, kind of, if you would have like a, like a wish, basically, regarding the input data, because we have in Finland these nationwide programs for the imagery and from the LiDAR, and I assume that, you know, there might be changes to the input data that could help the processing chain afterwards, basically. Like, what would it be? You know, is it because we have seen this this trend towards higher resolution, higher densities, and so on? What do you think would help if we could modify the input data in the processing chain afterwards? Yeah, during these uh, two uh, projects, actually, we have tested this uh, transfer learning techniques. So. Uh, we we during these two projects actually we produced uh, I haven't mentioned produced five master thesis workers and uh, there are uh, one of them is about the transfer learning so we we were deal with uh, this kind of a situation that uh, we train the model and in the future if there are some changes so we are going to use the transfer learning techniques and uh, to be able to use for the new data sets as well. Thanks. And maybe I could add to this that that we are also checking into what sort of a data sets in the future we shall have or st start collecting in the becoming national uh, LiDAR and aerial image programs. And, and if those are more tense, we have some test data just coming up from last summer. So we are obviously testing uh, these data sets as well with the AI and to see whether how much, whether it will help uh, also these, these tests and outcomes. Okay, I, I think we can start summing up. Um, I also still want to thank you, uh, Mika Kostamo and, and Geoforum for, for uh, making this setup available for us. It, it has been a pleasure to be here in, in Maria 01 again. Uh, Thank you for all of you on here, alive, <laughs> in person, <laughs> and then thank you all the alive persons also online uh, for joining our our seminar. Uh, we we are going to continue our AI work in in spatial data production in National Land Survey, and, and hopefully uh, we can get together um, on these issues again at at some point. Anyways, next year we are going to to be focusing uh, well, well still on the water issues in a way. And, and also we, we now want to, to take these results uh, as a part of our like daily work, the, the spatial data, database updating. So we are focusing on that, but also we want to dig in deeper into the road issues as, as well next year. So there's like new things coming up, but also we are continuing our work. And thank you also from my behalf for the great work this team has been doing for the past year and the past three years. And, and uh, I then, We'll just end this seminar by saying that thanks a lot, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. <laughs>